So I'm going to stay right down here because that's where the cookies are. And uh, so um, it's a real privilege to be talking to you today. And, and it's a great introduction. Um, we can quiz Shelley on that later on which titles at which places. But, but in short, I'm a data guy. I'm a measurement person. And unlike a lot of your perspectives and a lot of your world, I spend most of my time looking at spreadsheets and data rather than kids. So it's really exciting for me to be above ground and looking at smiling faces and have cookies in the room and everything. But I wanted to recognize, you know, this is Friday afternoon. Just had a nice lunch. Thank you, MassQ. What could be the most exciting and engaging topic in education today? Why did we all want to become teachers and work in schools? Educational research and data, right? No? OK. So again, I recognize that. I recognize that um, my colleagues have potentially abused um, educational research in the past, and I'm here to help make that right today. Um, and just to sort of lay out where I'm coming from, and I like the morning keynote because it was really, we really kind of got the personal story of, of how the, the, he, he became who he was. And, and a little bit on my background, I've never been a classroom teacher. I've taught grad school, which is probably like the opposite of, of good pedagogy, as most of us know who have been to grad school. I'm not an instructional technology expert. You will see from the quality of my slides that I am not an expert in PowerPoint or you know, being really engaging with technology. But I am a researcher. And I conduct and design studies all over the world on how technology is changing the lives of teachers and students. And you know, my background, I was trained at Boston College. I got my doctorate there. And, and basically, you know, on the degree, it says I'm a psychometrician. And whenever you're introduced to someone who has psycho in the job title, you want to be slightly, you know, so just by show of hands, and I'm, I'm always trying to get assessment data, right? How many know what a psychometrician is? Pretty good. Jeff Sons in the back, he's another psychometrician, so he doesn't count. But um, psychometricians are basically people who study testing. We're the sausage makers of the evaluation and assessment industry. A lot of the people I went to school with and graduated with work for like the GRE or they're the people working around the new adaptive assessments that are going to be entering your schools very soon through the um, coalitions. So again, coming at this from a really different perspective in a different field. And what I've done, much the same as you have done as teachers, and again, let's, let's say, who is a classroom teacher primarily here? Good, excellent. And who would sort of define more of what they do as being more leadership administrative? Okay, a little bit of overlap too, good. So, excellent. So, I'm coming to you from very much the same perspective. And I'm in this field of educational measurement, statistics, right? And it's this old, stoic, well-established field, mostly of old white guys, right? And it has this long trajectory and this long history. And in comes computing technologies. And it starts to disrupt the way we do things. And before we go any further, can anyone just guess what the sort of the educational techno what's the technology that drives educational measurement today and research? That's really the predominant force. SPSS, that's good. That's the statistical program that you were forced to use if you went to graduate school that we use for, for creating all those great, that tells you if we have statistical significance or not. That's an important one. Other ideas? What's that? Excel, yep, that's definitely a great way to make spreadsheets and, and visualize data. And I'm going to share some ideas around data visualization a little later. Don't get too excited, but it's coming soon. Survey Monkey, we all know Survey Monkey. We'll go back all the way to 1937. Does anyone know what this is? Exactly. This is the IBM 805. And to be fair, this is a model from the 50s. So it's a little more curved than the model, the original model from 1937. This was invented by a teacher in Michigan, a high school teacher. And he originally thought of it as a lazy teacher's gimmick. He had like 80 to 120 kids every year. He was giving the same test, and he had to grade them over and over again. He was a clever guy. He figured out that a magic number two pencil and a bubble response could make his life much easier. And instead of spending hours grading, he could just run these things through a machine and spend the rest of his time 
actually doing teaching and learning. Here's an ad from the 1950s, and I'm just going to quote a little bit of this. This is from the original promotional material from these scanning devices. Results are obtained so rapidly that virtually all of the teacher's time may be spent in creative endeavor, where it is most effective, rather than on routine or clerical work. And if you guys are interested in this, you can write to IBM at 590 Madison Avenue. I don't have the email address with this literature. My point is, is that this was a technology. You know, when we think of technology, we often think of, you know, things in our, these crazy phones we have today and iPads and all this. But this was a technology that changed the way my entire field worked. When we think of measuring success at the, of students or at teachers, how often are we sort of retrofitting our idea to five response choices in a number two pencil? This has permeated not only our practice, but our very consciousness around assessment and measurement. And I'll give a story. And, and I'm kind of, you know, again, personally, I'm, I'm always sort of evaluating technology. Is this, what's, what's the best tool for the best use of my time? Is this going to help me or not? I'm not the earliest adopter, we'll just say, to put it frankly. And, you know, I go shopping as rarely as I have to. I need new shirts for conferences. And I go to the Gap. And I wait till the store is just about ready to close. And I go in and I find my shirt and I pay for it and I get a receipt. And on the receipt's a QR code. And it's been explained to me that I could use my smartphone, just, and this is sci-fi to me, and I can scan the QR code. And the Gap will bring up an HTML-based survey, and they're going to know who I am, what time of day I shop. Yeah, all this, in, you know, this like super Buck Rogers, high-tech, unbelievable to fathom information about my shopping habits. They might know that like what colors I like. They might even know like my size might have increased over the last few years, maybe. Um, and then they ask, how satisfied am I with the purchase? And this is what I get. Five buttons. Very satisfied to not very satisfied. And I select with my thumb or something on the smartphone and send them that information. So it's just an example of when we think around measurement, when we think about the things that we care most about in education or even out in the world, we're often forcing our thinking without realizing it into these number two pencil, five response answer sheets. And by the 60s, they had actually come up with a green form that had 10 response choices, which really changed our worlds. So to this day, this technology is still very much with us. And you know, this is the world I'm coming from. You might sort of be frustrated at the slow pace of movement in <laughs> schools or in education, but it's also with us in educational measurement. And so my colleagues and I are trying to push that envelope. We're trying to say, just the same way you're doing in your schools and classrooms, how can we leverage this technology? Not just to give those five response choices on a screen, but how can we actually get to what we really care about most? And how can we measure what we really care about? And so my job description, again, is basically designing and conducting studies. And my work is focused in places with educational technology. So I'm leveraging those very resources that you're putting in to the classrooms to be able to collect better information and data and provide that back. In general, when we think about educational research, we think about, you know, what is the outcome? What is success? We define that. That's the first step. We have to ask the right question. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time unpacking that. In this case, I'll just say like math achievement. And how do we measure math achievement in Massachusetts? The MCAS. I thought everyone would say it at once. But. Then we want to measure students' access to that given technology. You know, we know the iPads sort of float down on parachutes and land on student desks. Teaching and learning improves and scores go up, right? But we want to measure that access. Is access changing? Is it becoming greater, we would expect? Then we want to measure what's actually happening. What are those teaching and learning practices in the classroom? What is use? Is the teacher doing what I'm doing and standing up in the front of the room? Is the sage on the stage all day? Are they actually in the kids using the devices to follow their own learning paths? How often are those things happening? And we can measure that to some extent. And then we try to look at the relationship between that access, the use that we see, and whatever that outcome is. It is up to you, the people eating cookies, not talking, what the right question should be. You don't want the educational measurement people defining what the outcome should be. And for a long time, that's kind of been the case. So when we think about 
how I've tried to apply this. And so, you know, as, as Shelley said, I've spent 15 years now studying one-to-one -one computing technologies. Can anyone guess when the first one-to-one -one program actually was with a K-12 program? Not at the college level? What was that? Brewster Academy. What year was that? Do we remember? 98, yep, I remember that. I was just starting my research back then. Any other guesses? It's actually older than that. We just celebrated the 25th anniversary of the first one-to-one -one student computing program. It was with fifth grade girls in Australia at a school called the Ladies Methodist School near Melbourne. Now you can imagine this was 1989-1990 school year. How big those laptops must have been, right? The girls has, must have been like, you know, Popeye arms carrying them around. But again, this is an idea that's been around for a long time. And as measurement people, we try to make sense of the world around us. And the student to computer ratio is a really great example of how a measurement person would think about the studying or measuring access or use of technology. This is a great ratio because it shows how things have changed and we can sort of model. So back when I was in school, 1983, right, I shared the device, on, this is the US public school average, with about 125 of my closest friends. Access was very much shared. And what that looked like, they were computer labs, they were tended to be, you know, way out of the way. My experience was, you know, in third and fourth grade, we'd be sitting in class and once every two to three weeks, our teacher would get us all up. We'd march down the hallway, down the stairs, find the room, all the locks to unopen the door. We'd spend about 10 or 15 minutes not touching anything while the teacher booted up the machines. I would get to play Lemonade. If anyone remember the Lemonade game, it's real, I still, it's my favorite game. Um, sunny day like this, I'd be making a lot of lemonade. Um, while the honors kids did Oregon Trail. And we did this for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then it was time, you know, for the next class. The teacher spent about 10 minutes logging everyone off, turning everything off, dusting off, you know, locking the door again. And we went back to our room. And it was entirely disconnected. So we know what that kind of access ratio is like. It planted a lot of seeds amongst my generation, but it didn't really have the market force that we see today. Fast forward to the late 90s. This is the, the MCAS era. You know, the Educational Opportunity Act is uh, bringing out the MCAS at the state level. And in 1998, we see this massive shift. Lots of technology in schools. Their access is now six to one. So. I'm now only sharing my device with five or six of my friends, still mostly in computer labs in the 90s, the late 90s. Today, that number is somewhere around three to four to one, depending on how you define computing device, as well as how some schools define students, which is more of an issue in Texas, um, where there's controversial definitions of who is a student and who is not. But this is a great example of how that number shows that change. And we can use one number to say, you know, we went from 125 to 1 to 3 to 1. That's a monumental shift in students' access to devices in school over that time period. What we know, though, even in those 3 to 1 settings from the research, is that even when we have leveraged all these tools, when it is not a one-to-one -one ratio, use tends to be pretty sporadic. And as an educational researcher, if I'm studying something that's really sporadic, it's very hard to see an impact from it. So we know from about 10 or 15 years now of pretty formal one-to-one -one research that one-to-one -one is kind of a magic number and that something happens with that ratio. Despite all of this interest, there are still very few schools and programs that have studied this or have empirically sort of sought to answer the impacts of this these investments. So we see headlines in the New York Times from time to time saying, we're spending all this money on technology and what can we show for it? So we have a lot of interest in one-to-one -one computing. We've learned a lot about one-to-one -one computing models, but we are very far from having answered all the questions. We are still very much writing the story, okay? What we know so far, and this is about as much research results as I'm gonna share. One-to-one -one defines only the access point. Everything else is an assumption. We tend to think, going back to like Seymour Papert and even all the way back to Piaget, that one-to-one -one computing means something around student-centered learning or kids learning how to learn. I have evaluated one-to-one -one programs where the goal is test prep. 
this is a more effective way of doing test prep than we did formally. Can you study that? I said, well, we could if that's what your goal is. So we bring to this conversation a lot of assumptions around teaching and learning when we talk about one-to-one. -one. And I think it's important that when you look across the table, not all these one-to-one -one programs might have the same alignments and the same general outcomes, okay? We spend a lot of time, and we see this everywhere, on the devices. The emphasis is on the devices, the distribution of the devices, whether they're gonna have a backpack or a side carrier, what the take-home policy will be, and to the point where once the devices are actually in kids' hands, a lot of the energy has been expended and no one's really going back to the real conversation of teaching and learning. So we end up focusing a lot on the device and the mechanics of having these devices in our buildings without thinking, without with sort of by losing, and losing sight of these bigger pictures, things that we really care about much more deeply than devices. We know, much to the disappointment perhaps of some state and federal policy leaders, the teachers still really, really matter. And when a teacher closes their door, it's going to be their ultimate decision how effective any of those technology resources are. Teachers are still very much the gatekeeper in the vast majority of public school classrooms, whether they're one-to-one -one or shared models. We know because of this, teachers need support. And there's a real common, I think I came up with this idea working in Massachusetts with the state. And this was idea that, you know, we, we gave you guys laptops, where are the results? And it's again that focus on the device and not the process. And we know that to be successful and sustainable in a one-to-one -one program, you need ongoing professional support for your teachers. It's just that simple. It also helps to have good, strong building level leadership. It doesn't have to necessarily be the principal, but someone in that building sort of setting the pace and modeling what they, the expectation should be for the staff. Those pieces aren't necessary for a three-year program, but they seem to be really important when we talk about sustaining programs across refreshes and really moving programs from a short-term sort of this new thing to being just how teaching and learning works within a school. So again, support for teachers and strong building level leadership. And moreover, and this is kind of where I'm headed, is an organism needs information to grow and learn. What kind of information are you using to inform the decisions you're making? How, when do we have the time? How much time are we willing to give the investments we've made? I've gone into a lot of situations and said, you know, we distributed these devices in April and we looked at the MCAS results and I, they look just like last year. So well, when was the MCAS? And I said, well, May 1st. You know, I mean, we have to have reasonable expectations. If we're talking about transforming pedagogy, if we're talking about like revolutionizing teaching and learning, we might need more than a school year to do it. And it's very important to communicate that to your stakeholders because that expectation is often just assumed. You got the devices, what are you doing with them? I mean, this is very much a process. And ultimately, how do we measure success? So I recognize most of us don't spend lunch hanging out and talking with peers from other schools. We're actually putting out fires and trying to find subs and wonder where our buses are and everything. But here we are on a Friday afternoon in sunny Worcester, and I thought we'd just spend a little time thinking more like researchers and stepping back. And I'll play devil's advocate. Why are you investing in educational technologies? We ask this question a lot. You may hear this question a lot. Things worked when I was in school. Look at me. And that's usually, you're like, well, that's why we're investing in educational technology. <laughs> you get it from your communities, you get it from parents, you get it from within your schools. And ultimately, I had a full head of hair when I started asking this question. The question sort of begets bigger questions and what we really end up with is what's the purpose of school? Why are we doing this? And what we'd like to think as sort of the erudite professor, right, is that teachers and, and building level leadership are constantly talking and you know, reflecting on their purpose and their goal and what they're doing. But re the reality is that's very rare. We rarely have the opportunity to engage in these bigger conversations around what we're doing, whether we're a classroom teacher, whether we're running a building, whether we're running a district. And what we find is that there's a tremendous amount of assumptions that we bring to that table. And again, coming at this from the perspective of a research guy, I worked with a couple colleagues and we thought, well, maybe we could find, you know, all schools have a mission statement, or nearly all schools across the world have a mission statement. That, even though mission statements can be like pretty vacuous and 
you know, just hide in the corner. It's at least something. And so we spent more time than I care to admit trying to analyze mission statements and look at what are the components that schools themselves are saying they exist for. What is the purpose? Why are you in education? What made you passionate enough to want to go back? And, and, and I guess it's 9% of people who go through the educational system even consider going back and working in it later, just to give you a, uh, an idea. So we tried to take the researcher's approach and look at, across public school mission statements, what are those components that schools are identifying as their rationale? And this is basically what we found across, this actually includes private schools as well. And so this is across K-12 schools, and these are the kinds of things when we talk to school leaders, when we talk to teachers, when we look at mission statements, these are the kinds of things schools do in our world, in our communities. And again, all of the PowerPoint slides we'll put up online and you'll have access to all of this. Because we're research geeks, we also came up with a rubric and came up with reliability. So we could take a mission statement from Swahili or from you know, Worcester and, and have 15 graduate students look at it and all be able to code what those thematic elements are with a fairly high degree of reliability. So if we're looking at something like emotional development of students, this is actually the most commonly occurring theme across all public schools in the US, is things like reaching potential, emotional skills, um, spiritual development potentially in, in private and parochial schools. And so I'll give you an example of this. You're an administrator, you're a teacher, you're at El, in El Centro, California. This is a real mission statement from a public school in Southern California. And I want you to think about it. You're implementing a one-to-one -one iPad program or a one-to-one -one technology program here. And the question is, how are we gonna measure what success looks like? I'm gonna read the mission statement and, and think about these different themes here, okay? And think about what, what success looks like, all right? So the mission of BT Washington School is to create and maintain an environment that assures our students reach a high level of academic achievement as measured by state assessments. We commit to a comprehensive system of support to ensure this outcome. How do we measure success as El Centro school leadership or in the community? State test scores, right? It's so simple, they're laying it right out. Who wants to work in El Centro? Who wants to send their kids to this school? Yeah. Coincidentally, the superintendent is in federal prison at this point for faking, no, this is true. For, I, was shared, I shared this for years before someone from El Centro actually came up to me and they're like, do you know what happened? The superintendent is still in a federal prison for faking years and years of scores, which they were then using to get grant money for the community and, and for his consulting business. And so it really shows the emphasis of one school. So let's pretend we've decided El Centro is in the right community, it's too much sunshine, they don't get enough snow. Let's come back to New England and we'll go to Salem, Massachusetts. This is a real mission statement, it might be a couple years old, from the Bates Elementary School. And no offense to anyone from Salem if they're here. I'm gonna read the mission statement and I want you to think about how we measure success in this school, okay? You're an administrator, you're a teacher, you're a community member, you're implementing this program, how do we know if it's working? Okay, here we go. By focusing on the enhancement of the arts, by building a foundation for literacy, and maximizing the potential of the whole child, the Bates Elementary School strives to guide our students beyond their creative horizons, surrounded by a safe, friendly, and child-centered community. How do we know if our investments are paying off. It's a lot harder, because qualitative data, it's, it's a little trickier. Now, the good news is it's not impossible at all. But the mistake would be for this school to simply say, look at our test scores. There's a misalignment between what they're espousing and how they're being evaluated in their assessment. And for a long time, assessments and outcomes have always been top down. They've always been punitive. You guys have been hit over the head with scores, basically. We are at a, t at a point where that's no longer necessarily the case, and schools are becoming more and more empowered across the world at defining for themselves what success looks like and taking steps, sometimes very small steps, and showing the efficacy of what they actually care about and showing success on their own terms. So when they say, well, yeah, MCAS scores were flat at Bates last year, but look at 
how students' aspirations have changed. Look at how teacher satisfaction and engagement have changed. You know, we used to have 25% of our teachers leave at the end of every year, they're staying. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for information to define success how you want, but it's important you ask the right question. And so the point is, is that you should have alignment between what you're actually espousing, what your practices are, and what your assessments are. And we all probably know the example from Los Angeles Unified Schools with their iPad program, which if you just sort of read what was in the press, was a complete failure, to put it nicely. Um, you know, just a real mess in terms of their implementation. And I think if you actually go through and look at the, the background and, and read the stories, that there was no common understanding of what success would look like or how the devices would be used. If they set out from the beginning, the kids were under the impression they were getting devices that would go on the internet and be research tools and do things like that. The district's perspective, I think, was more that this would be a curriculum delivery device. And it was basically just replacing a textbook. And so there was this real difference of assumptions before they, you know, it, I'm not saying it could have been avoided, but by setting your expectations clear for your community is a really important step for your long-term sustainability and scalability of the investments you have today. We are at a really unique point and, you know, all of the resources that you've leveraged into your classrooms to improve pedagogy and teaching and learning can also be used to help you get some data and information on what you care about. So we're trying to figure out ways of capturing not just academic performance, because we've gotten pretty good at that, right? We've gotten pretty good at academic and cognitive math and ELA scores. But what about those other components? How, how do you show you're being successful? And, and schools have access to things like computer adaptive surveys and tools, things like SurveyMonkey and Google Forms give you the kinds of opportunities for getting staff and student feedback that you never really had that easily before. I work in schools where sometimes someone will come up with an assumption during a pre, you know, before the kids even get in the room and say, you know, our kids are all on Facebook and that makes it so hard to teach. And we'll say, well, let's ask the kids. We'll give a quick survey after lunch and have all the kids go on Google Forms and at the end of the day we're in a staff meeting and we say 68% of your students are on or at least admit to being on Facebook and let's dig a little deeper on who those kids that are on or aren't and question those assumptions in real time. We have the opportunity to do that today. The kinds of tools we use for online for classroom observations have changed quite a bit and have really become much more fine-tuned to a variety of kinds of um, different facets that you might be interested in looking at. Similarly, the opportunities of big data and learning analytics. Whether you are a preschool teacher or a building level leader or a, the superintendent of the largest district in the state, you will have more access to data and information in the next five years than you ever had. Will we be prepared to do anything with it? Will we be sort of driving that ship or will we be being run over by it? How, is, how will teachers and schools start to make use of that new information? So this is my soapbox. This is my soapbox slide. Most of what I've told you, I think, has just really been my observations from research. I don't have sort of much of my own agenda. I don't know the right way to teach seventh grade pre-algebra. I'm the wrong guy to ask here. But I do know a lot about measurement and being reflective. And here's what I've seen. And this is sort of my sales pitch, why you might be interested on a Friday afternoon about actually thinking about data and research. Number one, before you actually collect any data, before you get any feedback back, the process of thinking about how you measure something really strengthens your conversations. To bring your constituents together and say, okay, what is a 21st century skill? And hear the different perspectives around that. Or to say, how do we know when our kids are engaged and motivated and what does that look like? And by just thinking about measuring these things really strengthens our conversations and brings our assumptions to the table. So even before we collect any data, we often find there's a real value in having an opportunity to engage around these kind of conversations, okay? Second, you're empowering the voice of your actual constituents. And, and again, this might seem like a no-brainer for really engaged educators, but you have, you know, everyone in one building. 
in some cases. What is teacher sentiment towards this? What is student sentiment? How is practices changing? You have the opportunity to go in and get that information directly from those constituents and stakeholders and use that. Again, I would hope these are conversations that are, might already be happening. You hear a lot about like data-driven decision making and I sort of shy away from that. I don't know if I want to be a student or a teacher in a place that's using just data to drive decision making. But I think there's a huge capacity for data-informed reflections and informing those conversations and ongoing discussions and sometimes they're really long-term discussions about why am I here and what are we doing with these kids. How can we use this information to empower and brighten up those conversations, okay? We talked a little bit about, you know, teaching and learning as this, in school as these, you know, old-fashioned static institutions, right? How are we documenting these radical changes that might be happening? Research is a really great opportunity to be able to say, you know, five years ago, these were the kinds of pedagogies we saw in our middle school. Here's where they're at today. Is this a good change or a bad change? You know, and why? We want to, you know, a lot of times I get to visit schools all around the world and I go into a school and, you know, even a great one-to-one -one school and regardless of where you are or how great you are, there's always going to be sort of what we call pockets of innovation or, you know, places that are just not getting quite enough resources or enough sunshine and the garden isn't quite growing as well. And doing just a very simple survey of staff practices or student practices is like turning the lights on if it's done correctly. And it's like just shining the flashlight. And the data in and of itself is not going to answer your questions. The data is agnostic. But the kinds of information that can feed back into your ongoing discussions can be really powerful. Why is it that our math teachers look so different from all the other teachers in our high school? Is it because they're all 15 years older on average? Is it because just teaching math is such a different curricular experience or pedagogical experience? Or does it have to do with the, you know, the lasting shadow of the graphing calculator generation or something? I mean, and you have a way of sort of shining that flashlight. Regardless how successful or how, you know, unsuccessful your program is, there's opportunities to see where those pockets of success are and kind of shine the flashlight around the walls of the cave. We're all planning, whether we're classroom teachers or school leaders. How can we support the planning we're doing? Who needs what kinds of resources and what PD? We can use research to, in, to get that. We obviously have goals and timelines and strategic plans. Again, how do we know when we're there? Research is your friend. For a long time, it feels like research has been very top-down. Data has been you know, punitive. There's real opportunities, again, to sort of take ownership of this. And finally, this idea of a culture. How do we make decisions? How do we know when we're successful? This is a constantly in flux. This isn't a static kind of idea. Data is your friend in this case. It's like the dashboard on your car. It's not going to necessarily make you a better driver right away, but you have the ability to sort of get an idea, and I can actually punch some buttons on my car and say, like, when I drive the car, I get half the gas mileage my wife does. Does that tell me something about my driving habits? Now, that might not make me actually change the way I drive, but that information could be really valuable to add to our ongoing arguments. I mean, conversations about wear and tear on our vehicles that we share. How do we build that culture? And I'll give a quick example from, uh, I think uh, it was mentioned by Shelley that I, I wear a lot of different hats, and one of them is with the edX project. And this project is just ending now, but we actually looked at taking courses that were at MIT and then offer to the world in this MOOC format. So you have, you know, a course that had been pro private, you know, for 80 students at MIT for years. Now we have 100,000 students signed up and they're watching the first lecture. We are looking at all that data. So when the students sign up, they take a little survey. We ask what courses they've had. What kind of background experience do they have? Is English their native language if the course is taught in English? Then I look at the learning analytics I'm getting from YouTube on the first lecture, the first video. At minute 13, a third of the students just dropped off and went back two minutes and rewatched it. Half of those students never came back to the class or the lecture again. The other half kept going back and looking through that, and once they made it, made it through the rest of the lecture without a problem. We went in and said, who were those students? And we found out they had a real different, they didn't have one of the, uh, they never had any calculus background. 
And the instructor at minute 13 was jumping into an example around calculus, which had nothing to do with the course content and was outside the prereqs of the course. This was an opportunity to say, look at this data. You've taught this course for years. You've been probably using this metaphor forever. But it actually has nothing to do with the class, and you're losing a lot of learners. Now, at MIT, it wasn't a problem. They're like the, the green berets of, of the educational world. You toss them anywhere, the worst professor, the worst book, and they're going to learn. But in the online format, you don't get that. We got real feedback that this is you know, not good. We can give this back to the, to the professor, but can we make them change their practice? They might just say, hey, it's a great metaphor. I'm sorry, it doesn't work for some people. So again, it's what you're good at. The data isn't going to answer your questions. You know, data scientists are not going to come in with golden keys and silver bullets. But it's, again, we can provide you some information to help you do what you do best. And that's think about school change and school culture and being really effective with the resources you have. So any questions? I'm going to give a couple real world examples here. Drink of water. Okay, everybody's still mostly awake. Do we want to take an arm stretch break or anything? Great. So this is an example from Maine. And I like this example a lot because this, is an exa this was one of the very first one-to-one -one iPad programs in the world. It was actually targeted at kindergarten kids, which when it was announced made a international media. In fact, Jay Leno was quipping jokes about how ridiculous it was to give kindergartners iPads. Basically, the world thought this was a terrible idea at first blush. That forced the district very, very quickly into defining why they were doing this. Really, it almost put them on the defensive, I might say, and talking about why they were doing this. And it forced their hand at saying, or at the very beginning, before they even distributed devices, why they thought it was a good idea and why they would see success. And it was all tied around, whether you think this is a good idea or not, academic and cognitive outcomes. And specifically, it was around student literacy and language. And they had been looking at years and years, decades, of ELA data and showing that by fourth grade, those kids that weren't at grade never made it up. And they thought, you know, we hear about the fourth grade slump and things like that. How could we target our er the earliest learners in this district to really get a jump start around literacy and language acquisition? And the idea was maybe it's this new device called an iPad. So, this is a real smart approach. They, they gave iPads out in small increments to kindergarten teachers and play around with it. Figure out what apps are worthwhile. Just take some time. We're not going to be breathing down your neck. See what works, what doesn't work. Word came back from the teachers that this was like. They loved it. They had some good apps. And, and they wanted to study this, though. This was really controversial. They had no budget. And you know, how do you survey incoming Kindergartners, right? That's our usual tools weren't real helpful. So we only used tools that the district already had in place. They already had an assessment system that looked at ELA outcomes at different intervals over the course of the school year. And I said, well, what if we randomized which kids got iPads, which classes and which ones didn't, just for the first nine weeks of school, even though that's a tiny period of time with pre-literate students, and looked at that outcome. And then we'll follow those kids over time and see, as all kids with iPads then, how, how do they do compared to historic levels? And the school defined what, how success is measured in ELA very clearly with these sort of nationally known assessments. Again, this is all in the presentation. And then they looked at the apps they were considering and, and mapped them out toward their outcomes and provided that to the teachers. So they did a lot of legwork behind the scenes. And at the end of the nine weeks, I looked at the growth between those kids that were randomly assigned to the iPad classes and those kids who were assigned just to the status quo, whatever was in the room, kindergarten. And what we see here, and it's probably hard to see from the back of the room, I won't call anyone out to, to, for stats 101 here, but overall, both kids showed learning gains. Kids learned letters over the first nine weeks of kindergarten. This is good news for all of us, right? We, we're, we're doing our job. Things are looking good. But the iPad group is represented in red, and the comparison is in blue. And if you look real carefully, particularly those at the front of the room, you see the iPad kids outperformed on every measure. Not by a huge margin, necessarily, but the results were pretty consistent. And those of you who have taken a stats class recently will be pleased to know that for the bottom one, hearing, recording, sounds, and words, that was actually a statistically significant difference in performance. 
And since then, we've been following these kids over time. So again, the point is that the district was able to define what their outcome was and how success would be measured. And based, once they had that, it was very easy to try to think of ways that we might be able to demonstrate and show to the community the early successes of their program on what they cared about most. I was able to present this in November of that first year to a very, to a school board that was like really nervous before this presentation, said okay, kids are on task, they're actually doing better than we might expect, let's keep the program going, this is good. And I've gone back over subsequent years and shared different data. This cost the district next to nothing, I mean, it cost them actually nothing. They had all of these tools in place. There was no new assessments, no new measures. So again, you may have some of the answers to your own questions without realizing it. Here's another example. Go down to Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn is a really unique community. It's the highest proportion of public housing in the United States. So it's that place you see on the movies when they show the urban grit in New York City. This is it, it's the projects. This was a one-to-one -one pilot program targeting fourth and fifth graders across different boroughs in the city. I'm just gonna share the results from Brownsville. I asked the school, how do we know what success is? Now, the city and the state had their own definitions, but within their school community, they said student engagement, student retention. If you're a fourth grader in Brownsville, your probability of making it through high school is one in five, okay? So think about that. I mean, that's a real educational obstacle there. So just retention, having kids in class and just being, being awake was like a big educational goal for them that they themselves defined. Student achievement, because this is New York City public schools and that's how teachers and schools are all measured. And then digital citizenship. As we implemented the program and I was studying it, we saw right away that you know, the kids were more engaged in class and we measured that through surveys over time and we measured it from talking to teachers and surveying teachers. That was pretty easy. We could see from the classroom observations and from the teachers and students data that the teachers were trying new instructional strategies. They were trying things they, couldn't, they were never doing before because instructional strategies in these schools were pretty limited, okay? And they were actually reaching out and doing Skypes with schools in other parts of the world, which was really interesting. But we use student drawings in this study. And I've used student drawings in a lot of different research, and it's a great source of data that you don't often think of as being data. And in this case, these two drawings basically tell the whole story of the implementation. This is the pre on, the, on your left. This is before one-to-one -one computing. Can anyone see what the dominant technology is? Smart board, you're exactly right. In 100% of the New York City classrooms I visited, all of them have a smart board and they're almost always all on. You see any other technology devices? The desktop, and it's actually the teacher's desk, which is how they're using the, the smart board. The kids are arranged, there's no desks in the room, there actually were, but the artist has labeled themselves me, just in case you're wondering. But what's the message? And, and no comments about the sage on the stage here. Buckle down, ELA test practice. Almost all of the drawings we ask kids, think about your English class, draw yourself learning English in school, and this is what their response was. Test prep, test practice. That was the reality of the class that we were able to actually show and measure through the kids' own drawings. A year, two years later, we go back. We now see one student and one teacher. In orange, you'll actually see that the student has a laptop and if you look real closely, they're actually on their curriculum. This was the time to know English and math curriculum they were using. On the smart board, which is still present, has never gone away in the drawings, ELA. How can we get ready for the ELA test? Teachers' names were published in the New York Times during the second year of our implementation based solely on how their students performed on the ELA and math tests. You can imagine what that did to our study and what it did to sort of that wide range of pedagogies we are starting to document. And it was actually the kids' drawings that showed this, this reality better than any other data source. So as much as you think about data being, you know, huge amounts of spreadsheets and numbers, it can often be something as direct as a fourth grader's drawing. We also looked at student attendance in that study, and again, this is an example of data that you may already have and you may already want to use, I'll just summarize that for the Brownsville school, during that first year, those kids had like a net gain of something like six school days compared to the comparison schools in Brownsville that didn't have the program. 
So it was a good, good result there. So th there's a lot of data that you already have. There's a lot of information that you have that you could use. And this is an example from a more recent study we just wrapped up with Natick Public Schools. I don't know, is anyone here from Natick today? I can talk about them then, perfect. So since they're not here, uh, so this is an example. A lot of us have done surveys before. Many of you have probably taken a survey that's come out of Boston College, and I apologize if you didn't enjoy the experience. But you know, we ask students how often you're using technology across classes. And for those of you familiar with Natick, this is a very this is a interesting because Natick is using a model where they used the new high school to sort of jumpstart their educational technology. It's one-to-one -one student computing program. And I know a number of schools and districts across the state are doing this. So at the end of year one, we gave a survey and asked students to reflect across all your different classes, how often are you using technology as a student in these classes? And you can see, you know, in technology class, uh, visual arts, English, social studies, we can get some broad idea. You know, not a lot in performing arts. We kind of expect that, right? Not a lot in health and PE by comparison. That makes sense. But we also looked at gender. And we took the survey results and we merged them with the school files on these kids. And we had to get parent permission to do it because we are doing this as outsiders. You don't have to do that internally. You have all of that information. So we merged. We had kids give us an identifying feature on the survey, like a name or an email or an ID. And then we used that to look up their course history, their demographic background, their testing data, and all of this information. And we created a very robust data set that allowed us to look for differences in student experiences. And in this case, it's looking at gender differences. Are boys and girls using technology to different extents within the school? And again, this data isn't going to answer the question, but it's going to inform the conversation. Here's an example, and again, this is like totally impossible to read from the back of the room, but we looked at kids' course histories. Are the kids who are taking one or more honors classes in high school having a different experience than those kids who aren't? You have this information. You know which kids are in which classes. It's very easy to merge that with basic survey data and see what those results are. And in this case, we found the way kids use technology did seem to have differences based on the kinds of classes they took. We know that there were Metco kids and kids with varying income levels, even though Natick's doing pretty well overall. We could look at, are those kids who are receiving free and reduced lunch using technology in different ways when they're in school than the kids who are not? And again, just to use this information to inform the ongoing conversations around the efficacy of investments and where they're at. So this was really interesting to sort of lead and facilitate these conversations. So it's, it's pretty important to think about asking the right questions, okay? And to think about how, how you know, if you if start with the wrong question, we're, it's, it's, it's just sort of giving you bad information about something you don't really care about. In my work, these are the most common examples around, you know, what is the impact of educational technology and one-to-one -one computing? But you don't want this defined for you. This should be something that you have ownership of. You should be in the driver's seat here. Ultimately, how do you know if you succeeded? Massachusetts has, I was thinking about you know, giving this talk here, and I've given similar talks all over the world at this point. And, and there is such a richness of academic institutions in Massachusetts and potential partnerships, and so many lonely graduate students looking for dissertation data or, you know, things they can help and focus with that would probably be fairly delighted to get a phone call from a neighboring school district and say, you know, we're really struggling with this. This is something you'd be interested in. And you might be surprised. So what I'm suggesting is, you know, given you're in Massachusetts, you can reach out and you might find some pretty good partners that are available and interested. Um, a lot of times in thinking about Massachusetts, data has been abused. You know, when we think about data and measurement, it's like, oh, not now, right? One more thing. But I think we need to start thinking about taking ownership and using data for the things that we care about and tracking the things that we think should be tracked rather than just what's sort of imposed upon us. And think about what data we already have access to. In general, mm -hmm. we think about formative use of data, how it's going to be used. We think about summative. 
And again, these are not mutually exclusive. One should really be feeding the other. And I'm just going to end with a little bit of what I'm sort of calling the brave new world of data and data visualizations. This is going to be, I think, completely mainstream, but some of the schools that we're working with now, we give them sort of the traditional evaluation report that goes on the shelf and gathers dust, but we also provide the data through these very um, dynamic, let's see if I can pull up an example, through these dynamic types of tools where this is a school in Cairo, Egypt. Oh, no, it's not a school in Cairo, Egypt. Well, I'll give the example from the PowerPoint. Where basically, you can have access to all of your information and start selecting things. Like, I want to see just the results for girls. I want to see just girls who tell us we have a Facebook account. And so we can ask a question like, I, I feel like I'm distracted when I use technology in class and have all of the students in a building answer it, and then get some background information on those kids and see which kids are actually telling you they're distracted. And what we find is that, you know, the nuance really matters. And when we say, you know, oh, Facebook's just making kids so distracted in class, there's actually more of a story than that. It's which kids who use Facebook in which ways are the ones who are really distracted in class. And which kids are able to use Facebook at home and then come into school and be really effective. So the nuance and the data can really illuminate the questions that you're focused on and, and struggling with. Um, and the way we can visualize that information is, is really changing and really exciting for us. And I think it's going to be much more accessible than what you've seen in the past from my field. That's my hope. And it's always good to sort of wrap up with someone you know, a lot smarter than you. And I'll go back to Seymour Papert. You can't do much better than Seymour. He's basically the, the grandfather of all of this work that we've been doing. And, and he sort of laid out in the book Mindstorms back in 1980 this concern that it's very hard for us to think into the future because so much of our work is just focused on the what technology can do here and now. And I know this is a pretty dynamic, far-thinking group as a whole, but it's so easy to sort of focus on subs and buses and those you know, like immediate fires that are in front of us and not the big strategic ideas that got us excited about education in the first place. So I welcome feedback and comments and uh, questions and Again, there's a lot of probably lonely educational researchers in this state that I would recommend you reach out to and ask good questions and ask if they have surveys that could help you or ask them if they can make sense of the data that you're sitting on already. So enjoy the rest of your cookies. Thanks for leaving me a couple and uh, see you soon.